Welcome to the Capital Forum's Antitrust Interview Series hosted by Kroll on Track. My name is Karina Lubell and I'm joined today by Scott Schur, a partner in the Washington office of Wilson Sonsini. Uh, today Scott and I are going to be talking about the antitrust issues facing uh, internet platform monopolies. So Scott, first of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I think we should start off with, because of the unique nature uh, or the unique characteristics of um, internet platform monopolies, they face uh, an interesting set of antitrust issues. So maybe we could start off by talking about what a few of those characteristics are. Yeah, so, so I think when you think of a network platform, you think of a couple of things. You think of the importance of network effects, first of all, and network effects are quite simply when uh, a, the way a platform grows and its importance increases is by having more and more people on the particular platform. Uh, a platform could be a spectacular platform, but if it doesn't have members on it, it's not going to gain very much traction because the whole value of, or a big part of the value of the network is the number of users. Uh, scale is important for networks for the same, very same reason. Uh, and I think that there's also an importance of first mover advantage in, in network platforms. Uh, if you're there first, you're going to get the scale, and oftentimes it's difficult in a network to get people to switch. So think about Facebook. Well, it's easy to go from Facebook to MySpace, for example. You're not going to do that if you're a longtime user of Facebook because all of your contacts are there, all of your friends are there. So oftentimes networks are, are very sticky, uh, making it difficult for another platform to gain traction. Sure. Well, that sort of brings to mind one obvious issue uh, that, that we think about um, in an antitrust analysis, and that is barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. And if what you're saying is this is you have a first comer advantage, uh, what is the role or what should be the role of um, barriers to entry when we're analyzing uh, platform uh, companies? Well, I think that's I think that's a great question. Uh, switching costs are obviously really important. How hard is it going to be for someone to, to switch uh, from one platform to another platform? Uh, you also have to ask yourself in, in internet industries and specifically in platform industries, is there some sort of an advantage, uh, you know, is there a compelling reason to have a second platform in the market? It can't just be technology. There has to be some sort of a differentiation to get users to switch from uh, the product they're currently using to another product. So for example, uh, Facebook is, is obviously an important social network. Instagram quickly gained traction though. Uh, uh, they, they had 12 employees at the time that they were acquired for over a billion dollars. And why were they so important? Uh, the reason that they were so important is because they had developed a differentiation from Facebook. They were very good on mobile. Uh, they were. They had some very unique characteristics as to how they presented social uh, media, you know, through uh, different types of images, uh, and it created a demand uh, for the product that was separate and apart from the demand for Facebook. So you actually could be on both Facebook and Instagram. And so it, it seems like Instagram is sort of more the exception um, than the rule, and that there have been a number of companies that have attempted and and failed to enter into these markets. I mean, how much of that can be attributed to sort of natural, um, uh, let's just say, the, the natural workings of the market? And it, do you see a role for um, antitrust regulation um, in, in those markets and in uh, encouraging competition? So there definitely is a role for, for antitrust, particularly with regard to acquisition of platforms. Uh, so if you have an emerging popular platform being acquired by a dominant platform, you have to ask a couple of questions. You know, what's the reason for the acquisition uh, and what is going to be the ultimate effect of the acquisition? Uh, because entry is not always easy into these markets. And the reason you might see one uh, platform succeed where the, all the other ones did is because they just failed to find that key differentiating factor that made it sufficiently compelling to switch from one platform to the other. So I heard a lot of people back in uh, the time when Facebook acquired Instagram, for example, say, well, it's just a picture sharing app and there are tons of picture apps in the, in the app store on, on iOS or in the Google Play Store. Why, why aren't those substitutes? Well, they are substitutes, but they're poor substitutes because their user base was very small. So there was no need, the market demonstrated that there was really only a need to have one of these mobile picture sharing platforms that, uh, you know, or a platform that's a social platform that's based on the sharing of picture information as opposed to text information. The other ones just ended up falling to the wayside. Hmm. It seems like 
So when you when you think about the others, what you're maybe even unconsciously doing is defining the market and having that market be around photo sharing. But it seems to me that one of the challenges with these platform companies is that it is very hard to identify a market because they are so differentiated. So I, is there I mean, a large part of antitrust analysis is obviously, or as much as we try to get away from it, is, um, is market definition. How do you see that fitting in um, when we're looking at platform companies? Yeah, no, so it's, market definition is obviously important uh, and differentiated platforms might not compete directly against each other. Uh, they may have indirect effects against each other, and uh, or they may be the. I think the best way to think about uh, the power of a platform is you can have two differentiated products that don't currently compete against each other, but the user base of one makes it like likely that if that company that's currently differentiated wants to encroach and enter into the market of the other one, it's easier because they have the structure, they have the customers. Uh, to make it easy for them to simply add additional functionality to their platform to begin to compete against that, that other network. But market definition is, is it's obviously important, but uh, in addition to that, you also have to ask who are the best players to be able to develop a competitive alternative to the product that's on the market. And how do you identify them? Uh, it's very, it's difficult. <laughs> it's, it's predictive. And I think one of the reasons that the FTC cleared the, the Facebook Instagram deal is it's very difficult to challenge a transaction where a company enters a market and 18 months later uh, they're considered the market leader. Uh, it's still a relatively nascent market and the FTC, I think, or the DOJ would have an awfully difficult time going to court and arguing that a company with 12 employees that built itself up to a billion dollar company in 18 months is a market that's uh, uh, defined by one with high entry barriers. Now, the fact of the matter is there are high entry barriers sometimes, but it's very difficult using a normal rubric to say a company with 12 employees can actually be one with market power. Sure. Well, and it's actually, since you brought up the, the FTC and its approach to this, or presumably the DOJ, do you think that the agencies are, um, sort of have the right tools uh, today to approach these sorts of transactions, or is there something that you think would assist them? Yeah, I think they definitely have the right tools. I mean, obviously, this is all a predictive exercise, so determining and guessing whether or not a particular platform is going to grow and become a, 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 a viable competitor is difficult to do. But look at what the, the Federal Trade Commission did uh, in, the, in, the, in the Google uh, in the Google AdMob transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, those were two large mobile ad sharing networks. Uh, so those were networks, they were platforms, uh, AdMob was the largest player, Google was the second largest player, and it looked like the two parties had very high share. Sure. But at the end of the day, the FTC cleared the transaction in large part because Apple introduced what, what's, uh, what it called at the time iAd, which was its mobile advertising platform product. And the FTC looked at that and they said, IAD, Apple had announced that iAd was going to be the exclusive mobile ad network for iOS. And iOS at the time was, and probably still is, the dominant uh, mobile platform, uh, you know, cell phone, smartphone platform. So the major player saying that it's going to make its ad platform the exclusive ad platform made it very unlikely that at the end of the day that Google would be able to exercise any sorts of market power because Apple would grow so quickly. Sure. Well, in, in that example, I think that the timing was obviously convenient yes. um, to, to, to Google. Um, but even what you'd mentioned before about uh, a company can come in and within 18 months basically establish itself as essentially a platform monopoly. Um, given that the agencies typically when in the course of a merger analysis when they're looking to entry they look I think it's roughly two years right. down the line I and mean, that's an eternity when when we talk about internet platforms do you think that there's a need to um, adopt a shorter timeline uh, when when we're looking at at mergers in this industry yeah and I think one of the reasons the the agencies modified the guidelines to get rid of the two years. I mean, they still talk about two years in the 2010 guidelines, but they have a much more flexible analysis. Because you're absolutely right, Karina, that in some markets, two years is an eternity, and, uh, and a company can either grow really quickly or entrench itself very quickly within a two-year time period, even within a, or a six to a 12-month time period, depending upon the nature of the market. But it's just like 
oil and gas mergers or hospital mergers, you have to analyze the specific facts of the industry uh, and try to figure out and guess what's going to happen in the market based upon history. I think one of the reasons, uh, you know, in the closing statement for, for AdMob Google, uh, the FTC made it clear that, um, you know, this, is, this market's in its infancy and its nascent market, and do we really want to be in a position where we are taking aggressive enforcement action in a market that's uh, too early in its infancy uh, and potentially disrupt a vibrant market from developing by being too uh, interventionist? Sure. So that's one theory of thought. The other theory of thought is you actually do need to interfere relatively early because if you don't interfere early, you're going to end up with a company with a dominant market position. Sure. Well, that. It sounds like you agree with the, the FTC's decision um, in, in Google AdMob. Are there other instances when um, you think that the agencies have maybe overstepped or overregulated uh, in this, if it's such a nascent area, um, that they should have sort of let the, the market uh, continue to grow and evolve? No, I, I think the FTC has g actually gotten it right. I mean, they've done most of the platform mergers. They did Facebook, WhatsApp. They did Facebook, Instagram. Uh, they looked at Google AdMob. Uh, they look at conduct in a, for a number of these platforms. And I think, by and large, the FTC has gotten it right. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's obviously a very difficult task to do. And the FTC has stated in all of its closing statements or in its decisions to challenge in these, in these industries that very close calls, arguments on both sides. And it, it usually comes down to, at, 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 at the bottom, of a, of a desire not to interfere with the development of a particular market. I think that they've done a very good job, though, in the space. And do you see, so it, presumably you've done a number of these deals that have required not only um, clearance in the U.S., but also in other jurisdictions, notably the European Commission, mm -hmm. which takes a, a slightly different approach to um, both merger and conduct analysis in this area. Yeah. Um, are, what are the issues that you've run into um, with respect to the, the European Commission's investigation of these yeah. deals? So, so I, and not to be hypercritical of the European Commission, but I think one of the biggest problems with the Commission in, in, it, in many of its analyses is taking into account the opinion, too, too much the opinions of competitors as opposed to the opinions of customers and, and the likelihood of something happening. Uh, versus uh, remote possibility as articulated by a competitor. So I think that I think that they have erred that way. And I think that the other way the the commission analyzes things materially differently than in the United States is that the burden ends up on the parties to demonstrate that their conduct won't be anti-competitive uh, as opposed to putting the burden on the enforcement agencies. So I think simply switching the the, the burden of proof uh, as to who needs to prove what actually ends up at the end of the day being quite important in a market where you really could go either way. Hmm. I want to go back to one thing that you, you just said about um, the importance of uh, listening to customers as opposed to competitors. And it occurs to me that in when we talk about these um, internet platforms, a lot of them, the, the, the customers are consumers, are, are individuals as opposed to uh, sophisticated companies. Mm -hmm. um, in, it makes sense to me that in um, antitrust analysis and a merger analysis that you would look to customers uh, to, to get their reactions about what they expect to happen post-merger. Um, I guess I have a little less faith in uh, individuals being able to correctly identify what the issues are as opposed to a more sophisticated customer. Yeah. Do you think that we should still give individuals the same amount of credence that, yeah. that we would in so, antitrust so analysis? So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think that one of the important natures of, of these platforms is oftentimes they're two-sided. Uh, so, for example, uh, internet, an internet search platform uh, has both users like you and me who, do, who conduct search queries, but on the other side has also sophisticated advertisers uh, who have to buy advertising space on one of the platforms. And the views of advertisers in that instance could very well be important uh, in helping identify whether or not there's a problem with conduct or a problem with the merger. I agree that it would largely be in infeasible to go out and ask individual users as to their theory of uh, whether or not a transaction or conduct is problematic. One way to overcome that is potentially through surveys, using survey data, uh, or using third-party interest groups who 
you know, supposedly represent the interests of the consumers to act as a proxy for the other side of the market. But clearly where a lot of these platforms make money, Facebook doesn't make money off of you and me. They make money off of advertisers. I think the monetization of the platform uh, side of the market oftentimes is, is a better place to look to determine whether or not a transaction can be problematic. When, do you get the sense when you um, do represent companies, uh, sort of two-sided um, uh, platforms for the agencies that they are putting more emphasis on the, um, the, the advertising side as opposed to the consumer side, or are they equally concerned about both parties' interests? Yeah, so for a number of reasons, I, I, I think traditional antitrust tools just lead us to go to the side that's monetized, because you're asking the traditional question, is a transaction going to result in a 5 to 10 percent price increase? Right. Well, you, you and I don't pay for uh, a search platform or Facebook or for Twitter uh, or for LinkedIn. It's free for us. Uh, and the, the companies who end up paying are the advertisers, uh, the people who you know either want search advertising or display advertising. Those are the folks who end up paying. So it, it's easier for the FTC or the DOJ to try to make a determination as to whether or not conduct or transaction is going to result in a price increase on that side. But on the consumer side, the question isn't necessarily uh, is our prices going to go up, but is innovation going to be reduced, right? And you know. What is, you know, are the two parties who are in the market who are merging in the case of a merger really pushing each other to develop new, uh, you know, new interfaces, new, new technologies, run on new platforms, uh, or are they looking to a broader market and determining uh, uh, how to invest in research and development? So you can look instead of at prices if you're the FTC or DOJ, uh, more qualitative or, you know, uh, you know, mushy, mushy, very difficult to tell, more difficult things to predict like R&D. Okay. So, so what do you think, um, is there, just going back to something that you said earlier um, about the, uh, that there are sort of two ways to look at it. Um, obviously you want a certain, to allow, there should be a certain level of competition uh, so that the consumers uh, benefit from innovation and the, the advertisers from uh, somewhat lower prices or competitive prices. Um, have you, it, it sounds like though a number of the deals that we've talked about in this space, there haven't been concerns that they have gotten too big or amassed too much um, uh, market power to be able to stifle innovation or raise prices. Is there, how do you determine what the limit is and do you think that we will see it? I definitely think we'll see it and you know the fact that uh, you know Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp and, and Instagram were second requested and Google's acquisition of AdMob was second requested uh, and that you know at least in the European Commission the Microsoft Skype transaction was, was closely looked at. You know, you, you, I think we eventually will reach a point where, you know, and I, I, we're probably at the point where the agencies are asking very hard questions about whether or not a platform merger, uh, you know, and one that you're familiar with too is Zillow Trulia, you know, is going to create market power uh, on either side of the market. The fact of the matter is, as of, as of today, there are still plenty of places to advertise, uh, and I don't think that an agency yet has uh, determined that there's such a differentiated portion of the market for advertising that the two companies who are merging occupy that an advertiser couldn't very easily go out and find a, another, you know, slightly different but not completely different place to place advertising dollars to to beat back any sort of a price increase. Do you think that that's also a pr played a role in the uh, recently cleared Expedia Orbitz transaction? Yeah, mm -hmm. abso absolutely. Um, you know, for that, that's an interesting transaction because it's, it's, I would even look at that as like a three sided market uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to a two sided market. You have the advertisers, obviously, you have consumers like you and me, but you also have uh, vendors, uh, specifically hotel sites and uh, airlines, who also are trying to get the best deals that they can get from companies like Expedia and Orbitz. And I think, as, as you know, obviously I didn't work on that transaction, but the area where there was the most tension in the review of that deal was whether or not Expedia and Orbitz were going to be able to get better deals from the different hotel chains around the country because it was such an important destination for them to be able to place, uh, you know, to, for them to be able to get traction with consumers on, on those platforms. 
Well, it sounds like, I, obviously, with since you brought up Zillow Trulia and also Expedia Orbitz, I, those are two um, markets that have obviously consolidated to a certain extent, and, and I suppose it'll be interesting to see whether going forward um, we see we see some of these uh, antitrust issues arising. Um, I mean, do you do you think that we have reached the saturation point in any particular um, markets uh, with respect to? internet platforms? You know, I'm not sure. I, I certainly think that there are some mergers that would be awfully difficult to get through um, without without naming any of them because they might try to happen and then retain me later <laughs> on, so I don't want to prejudice myself. But, of course. But, but there are certainly some transactions that look a lot less doable today than they might have been two or three years ago uh, because, you know, the companies really do look as though they have a fairly high share of a particular market and it does look like they offer a fairly differentiated product to not only users but also to advertisers. Well, it'll be fun to, to see what uh, what the antitrust review has in store for yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think, Scott, we're actually out of time. Great. Um, but thank you for joining us this morning My for pleasure. our discussion about uh, the antitrust issues facing uh, internet um, platform monopolies. Thank you very much.